Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, I want to welcome you to this CSG eCademy webinar on rideshare companies and insurance presented in partnership with the Griffith Insurance Education Foundation. My name is Sean Sloan. I'm the Director of Transportation and Infrastructure Policy at the Council of State Governments in Lexington, Kentucky. This is a follow-up to a couple of webinars we did last year that introduced the insurance and regulatory issues involved with rideshare companies like Uber and Lyft and that summed up the latest legislative developments on the rideshare front. Uh, today we're going to look back on uh, policy developments impacting the rideshare industry in 2016 and what could lie ahead for 2017. We'll also take a look at the unresolved legal, regulatory, and insurance issues involved in rideshare, examine the state of competition and profitability within the industry, and spend some time pondering the role rideshare could play in advancing autonomous vehicle technologies, along with the policy and insurance implications of that convergence. CSG has been excited to partner with the Griffith Foundation on this webinar and a series of other events over the last two years. Uh, to say more about the partnership, I want to call on Frank Tomasello, Program Director at the Griffith Foundation, who joins us from suburban Philadelphia. Frank? Thank you, Sean. Uh, both the Griffith Foundation and CSG share similar missions, which include a commitment to a nonpartisan and non-advocative and academic approach to programming. And this is at the core uh, of our collaborative relationship. It's our pleasure here at Griffith to work with CSG. Together, our organization, organizations provide an opportunity for policymakers to gain valuable, unbiased knowledge about insurance through the lens of critical and emerging issues. Thanks, Frank. Uh, I'll ask you to introduce our speaker here in just a moment, but before we do that, just a quick note on how the, the webinar will run. If you have a question for our speaker at any time during the presentation, you may type it directly into the GoToWebinar interface on your computer screen. There is a question box on the GoToWebinar taskbar you can use for precisely that purpose. We will collect those here in Lexington and ask as many as time allows. And now back to Frank Tomasello to introduce our speaker and get us started. Thank you, Sean. For our webinar today, we welcome back as our speaker, Dr. Kim Staking, an assistant professor of finance at California State University in Sacramento. Dr. Staking has joined us for our previous webinars in the Rideshare series, as well as three in-state programs and a policy academy in Washington, D.C. over the last couple of years. So on behalf of Griffith and CSG, we want to personally thank him for his efforts to research these issues so we can keep policymakers informed on the latest developments in this important policy area. Dr. Staking received his doctorate from the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School, an MBA from the University of California, Berkeley, and a bachelor's degree from Brigham Young University. He has nearly three decades of academic and practical experience, including having served in senior level technical leadership positions at the Inter-American Development Bank. Uh, Dr. Staking, let's start with the map of legislative activity on rideshare. Uh, what can you tell us generally about where things stand around the country? Okay. Uh, yes, this is uh, Kim Staking. Uh, first, I want to thank the Griffith Foundation, Griffith Educational Foundation, and CSG for allowing me to share my knowledge issues. It's amazing. I've been working. I started working on rideshare a couple of years ago when it was relatively unknown. And today, legislatures, transportation specialists, insurers, and general public are have become quite familiar with it. A large portion of urban dwellers, in particular, have used rideshare services. Uber has almost be, has become a verb. So let's look at um, the, the state legislative map. As we see it, um, virtually all of the states have enacted that legislation or are have pending legislation. Uh, we only show um, uh, four states: uh, Oregon, um, um, Wyoming. Florida and uh, Delaware is not having uh, legislation. Uh, New Hampshire is shown as having legislation, but at the time the map was driven, they didn't have it. Um, but both Delaware and New Hampshire had uh, legislation that was signed uh, that was signed by the governor. Delaware on August 10th, and 
New Hampshire on June 4. So the remaining ones are Florida. There are really no uh, transportation network um, company laws. They adjourned to 2017, um, sort of pushing the statewide regulation forward, and the regulation is controlled at the county level. Um, we have Oregon, where there are no TNC laws. Bills failed. Um, however, it has been allowed by local regulation in Portland and in Beaverton, to Portland being the largest city and uh, Beaverton being a, uh, a major college town. Wyoming has no TNC laws, no ride sharing services provided there uh, at all. Missouri is an interesting one. They have used no TNC laws. There is ride sharing allowed in some laws in, in some cities, um, but it's not clear uh, that that there will be legislation coming up anytime too soon. The other ones with pending legislation are, are, are Massachusetts. Uh, in Massachusetts, the, um, the Senate passed the, the legislation, but it's waiting for the House to sign it. Uh, New Jersey, again, pending legislation. New York has pending le legislation, again, passed by one of the houses, not by the other. Currently, it's only available in New York City and uh, in surrounding areas. Pennsylvania, as well, uh, there was pending legislation uh, passed the Senate, uh, was being considered by the House, but passed in the next uh, legislative session. And uh, Rhode Island as well. Chair Front, uh, you mentioned just a moment ago uh, my home state of Pennsylvania, uh, and I thought, uh, if I may, let me ask you uh, about uh, dynamics in Pennsylvania. Uh, Uber and Lyft had been ordered to stop service in the Philadelphia market because uh, a temporary authorization from the legislature expired, and the state of Pennsylvania, as you alluded to, does not have comprehensive rideshare legislation yet. Now, as I understand it, a state appellate court recently blocked that lower court order uh, that had uh, required that operations be halted by Uber and Lyft. But my questions to you, Dr. Staking, are uh, what's been the holdup in getting legislation uh, in the state of Pennsylvania, uh, and what are the challenges uh, from an insurance perspective that Uber and Lyft face as they operate within the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania? Yeah, this, is, this is a difficult issue. Uber and Lyft had both been operating in Philadelphia. Uh, before that, um, you know, in July of this year, ride sharing was actually de declared illegal, um, and drivers could be pulled over, their cars could be confiscated. Um, and there was, then in, uh, excuse me, until July of this year, uh, it was illegal. In July, there was a budget agreement that offered Uber and Lyft to operate only in, in Philadelphia. Um, uh, but this, ex this extension expired September, September the 30th, as statewide legislation was not um, The state Senate had passed uh, legislation in November of uh, 2015, you know, opening the door to the legislation. Uh, a few amendments have been added to this, uh, but it was laid at the, at the table of the House in, in May of 2016, and it's just been sitting there, um, and it's been postponed to the next legislative cycle. It's the same issues that come up in other states. There's con concern about, or there's opposition from the taxi um, unions. There's opposition from um, uh, certain individuals that um, believe that they're not providing uh, uh, coverage for individuals with handicaps and that there may be some kind of unfair competition and the real questions about um, um, what they should do and how they should do it throughout the state. I'm not really certain what Lyft and Uber will do. Um, 
they were having the, the um, having the ride sharing operated before that. Uh, if it were me, I'd personally suspend to not create a, a backlash in the house. Um, but they may suspend uh, service to, to also to let riders drivers add their pressure to that being put by Uber and Lyft for making legislation uh, made to make a decision early in early in the uh, in the next session. Uh, Dr. Staking, Sean Sloan here at CSG in Lexington. Another state we wanted to ask you about uh, that we've heard may look to do ride share legislation next year is Texas, uh, where the issue of fingerprint background checks of drivers came up in cities like Austin and San Antonio this year. What do you see happening there and, and with this issue of, of the fingerprint background checks in general around the country? Uh, yeah, ride sharing has had been approved statewide in Texas, as you mentioned, um, but a couple of cities enacted stricter regulation. And the main issue was the was the fingerprint as part of that. Concept. This has been universally opposed by Uber and Lyft in all of the states due to what they view as a higher upfront cost. It may cost you know 100 or 150 dollars to get uh, fingerprinted, um, and it takes several days, and they say that will de delay the time that beyond uh, for somebody to be able to start driving um, beyond when they work, and they consider that their background checks are uh, are good enough that they don't need um, the, they don't need to have the background check. Austin uh, is, is Austin and Houston took two different approaches. Houston threatened. Uh, in in Houston, the ride-sharing companies threatened to fold out, and so they gave a partial postponement of the fingerprint issue. In Austin, you know, they did not pull back; they required the fingerprints, and Uber and Lyft both both pulled out. Uh, the interesting thing is that there are seven new companies that formed. Uh, some that came in from other states, smaller ride-sharing companies, uh, and are actively involved in in. And if they do the fingerprinting, they are, they follow the uh, other process. So, so, you know this, um, you know this fingerprint issue is one that uh, uh, Lyft and Uber have to uh, direct, uh, have to do look directly. Yeah, there were some articles recently also that, that said that uh, Uber is going to start using facial recognition for drivers. Is that something that's likely to, to put this uh, fingerprint background check issue to rest at all? Yeah, I don't believe so. I think there's still concern that somebody could game the system. Uh, much of the reason for the print fingerprints is that there's fear that uh, drivers are using false identities. So people that had felony backgrounds would use a false identity and uh, and use that for becoming a driver. There's not any kind of useful universal database. Um, I believe that some of the discussions that are taking place are more for the TNCs checking that the authorized driver is op operating, not a sibling or or a cousin who may look close enough that to to the driver that the dr that a passenger doesn't recognize the change. Um, but they, they, they'd like to have that facial recognition to make sure that they have an authorized driver in that car. Thank you, Dr. Staking. Uh, Frank Tomasello here at the Foundation. You mentioned at the opening of the session that Oregon is another state without rideshare legislation. Uh, and you noted, I think, very briefly that uh, a localized approach is in play in and around the Portland, Oregon area. Uh, to, to help our participants to understand what the issues are that they're dealing with in Oregon today. Oregon is a very, Oregon as a state is very divided between uh, liberal larger cities and more conservative urban areas and there are, there are large portions of Oregon where there's a, uh, where, where you, where the you know, taxi services are uh, are critical to to individuals in moving it. I think there's a fear that if you had Uber and Lyft operating, they would bypass the smaller cities 
um, but the taxi companies that may service those lot larger, those more uh, rural areas would, would be damaged. So at this point, Lyft and Uber are both operating in Portland where they have been authorized. Lyft is operating in Beavers. Um, I don't know if other municipals, municipalities are considered life sharing, but it has really left been left to the municipalities to make a determination of whether it's best for them. If there's such difference between the um, um, between the municipalities, I could imagine uh, a city like Ashton, where they have the large Shakespeare Festival, would be very open to ride sharing. Um, but you know, there, there hasn't been an approval yet. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Staking, New York is another state where they haven't seemed to be able to reach agreement on a bill. Uh, a couple of the issues there have been trying to level the playing field for rideshare and taxis and fingerprint background checks. Uh, another has been wheelchair accessibility, but there's also been a disagreement over minimum insurance requirements. Uh, what is the disagreement there? Yeah. Um, you know, again, like Oregon, there's a large political uh, division between the, the rural, uh, uh, you know, the, the rural upstate areas and the New York City areas. Uh, at this point, it's only available in New York and surrounding counties. Some of the some of the college towns uh, have sent letters to the legislation, uh, legislators asking them to approve it in their areas. I, I, I'm not sure I completely understand in the insurance issue that they're uh, they're dealing with. At this point, the ride-sharing insurance program, we'll, we'll get to that a little bit later, is um, probably providing better coverages um, than you have uh, in, um, in, in riding a taxi, at least from the passenger point of view. And uh, the, the fact that you have insurance companies that are operating in New York uh, that will be providing ride-sharing services uh, that the, the driver can also select a level of coverage that will be better than what is uh, what is required as the minimum where the, uh, where the where the driver could be responsible for any kind of, of large accident. Thank you. Um, a final question with respect to New York. What do you think will be the impact of the ruling the other day by the New York State regulators that uh, Uber drivers should be treated as employees rather than uh, independent contractors? Well, the classification of drivers and independent contractors continues to be controversial and settled. I'll return that, that a little bit later in, in the presentation. The recent rulings in New York were regarding unemployment claims. Uh, two drivers were uh, ruled to be employees, so they collect unemployment. Uh, these are similar claims that have been made, made by administrative courts in California. Again, one in terms of unemployment, the other one in terms of, of some kind of workers' compensation basis. Because these are administrative courts, they're usually limited to the individuals that are involved in the case. Uh, it's not something that, that automatically becomes a precedent for other court, uh, for, uh, for other cases, as you would have in a state or a judicial court that was, that was not, admin, not administrative law. Uh, this is, however, setting another precedent for, for this. Uh, you know, I think that the pressure for dealing uh, with the individuals will, will increase. You know, again, return to this issue a little bit later, but uh, it is a major one that's also causing a, a pause in legislation in, in a number of the states. Thank you, Dr. Staking. Uh, we have one more state we wanted to ask you about, and that is Massachusetts. Uh, let me take this opportunity to remind our viewers that if you have a question for our speaker, you may enter it in the GoToWebinar taskbar at any time. Uh, and uh, Dr. Staking, just a note to you that if, if you could speak directly into your, your uh, telephone handset, uh, you're, you're a little bit garbled on, on the, the ends of your words and things. It may be a little bit difficult for folks to 
make out what you're saying. So just to please speak into the uh, into the telephone. Uh, the uh, the rideshare legislation that passed in Massachusetts this year included a uh, five cent uh, fee per trip on rideshare services to subsidize the traditional taxi industry. Uh, do you see that as a notable precedent? It seems sort of unusual to me. I mean, you wouldn't think of of state government uh, requiring McDonald's customers to pay five cents on every Big Mac to help out Burger King. Is that what we're essentially talking about here? Um, I think it's a little bit different in ride sharing for a couple of reasons. Uh, the governor added that new fee on ride sharing. There's actually a 20 uh, cent fee that um, uh, that was added added to every ride. Um, of the 15% will be uh, split among local government, local municipalities, and, and public transportation. Um, again, public transportation being another competitor to to this. Five percent, uh, five percent, five cents of it will go to the traditional taxi drivers, and that suddenly the taxis will be eliminated in about five years. The idea, as I understand it, is to cover some of the lost. Co cost or lost value that taxi drivers have had um, for the for the medallions and in some ways this was a, the the economists really don't like uh, taxi medallions it's a state sponsored program that limits supply creates monopoly rents for those who uh, purchase the medallions only early and we've seen uh, you know in Massachusetts the value of a, of a medallion was sitting at about $750,000 prior, um, uh, prior to the ride-sharing companies uh, beginning, beginning to operate there. And it fell by about 50%, um, at, at least as, as of six months ago when I last looked at it. So this may be a little bit saying, OK, we had a program that protected you. You purchased a medallion at a very high rate. Uh, at a very high price. You weren't one of the early purchasers, but maybe you bought it for the 750000 and you've seen the value of that decrease by 50% or more. So because that program was created by the state, um, because, we, they, because they limited the supply of taxis, um, and again, they were really creating value for those that owned the medallions, they're saying let's uh, subsidize a little bit of that medallion. Uh, I, I think it's um, I think it's a recognition that the taxi drivers have a serious issue uh, in terms of competition, um, and you know giving something to them. Certainly, the taxi drivers would have liked to have seen much more, but uh, this is at least something that will that will provide some assistance to them as they transfer their models and they need to set up similar types of uh, app-based systems for for taxi services. Thank you, Dr. Staking. Uh, on behalf of my friend Sean Sloan, uh, we, we thank you for giving us uh, a bit of an idea of what's been happening around the country. Uh, what we'd like to do now is transition and uh, hand things off to you to take us through the major and in some cases still unresolved legislative, legal, and insurance-related issues involved with ride-sharing. So uh, the floor is yours. OK, let's go to the next slide. The issues, there, there are major legislative issues that, that, have, that are throughout the sharing economy and, and ride-sharing in particular, questioning its legality. Uh, what are the requirements for, for public safety? Is insurance uh, adequacy, are the background checks of the drivers uh, adequate? Is there proper disclosure of, of the risks? The insurance companies' rights, do they have the right to cancel or not renew insurance for somebody that starts working as a rideshare driver? Or can they deny coverage for somebody while they're engaged in ride-sharing? There are always the state and municipal rights, and you know, together with that, we have to remember uh, the voter preferences. And as we mentioned earlier, the issue of in the independent contracts, so the drivers being an independent drivers or independent contractors or employees, is is a very large 
issue. So let's move to the next slide to discuss that a little bit more. Um, let's, one more, please. As an employee, a driver would be able to seek reimbursement for gas expenses, repairs, depreciation, etc. As independent contractors, drivers have to cover these by themselves. Um, they have to pay the, the workers' portion of, of Social Security as well as the uh, as well as the um, uh, the employee contribution. So their contribution is 15% versus the seven and a half percent they would be paying as a as, as a contractor. They don't have access to workers' compensation, not necessarily, necessarily having good access to medical insurance um, that would cover them if they, if they get injured in the ride. While the rideshare ride driver contracts are very clear that they're independent contracts, this has been challenged in the courts as being inconsistent with state labor law. California is uh, one example where the state uh, labor law is, is extremely strict and it has been challenged um, whether the contractors, the independent contracts are truly independent. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, oh, um, and so one of the other issues that's critical for the independent uh, drivers is Oh, let, let me let me follow up with a thought about uh, uh, the independent drivers. We can go back one slide for a second. Um, in California, there have been judges by judgments, as we mentioned, by independent judges regarding the uh, employment issue. There was a major settlement agreed by Lyft and their drivers, um, um, originally at twelve and a half million dollars, which was rejected by a judge and then settled for $27 million. Um, there was a settlement agreed to by Uber and a group of drivers and their attorneys covering 240,000 drivers in California, 6,000 drivers in Massachusetts, who had agreed to a settlement of $100 million. Uh, a federal judge looked at this settlement and it was rejected. He says this only amounts to 10% of the possible damages and that there were very strong grounds for employee uh, designation. Similar lawsuits are taking place in Florida, Arizona, and Pennsylvania. Um, then, in, in, at least in California, in September, in, uh, just a couple months ago, the U.S. Ninth Court of Appeals in San Francisco um, said that uh, drivers who signed up with Uber in 2003 in 2013 and 2014 had to go to arbitration, not the courts, to resolve any disputes with the company if they had this arbitration clause. It doesn't directly deal directly with the class action suit regarding employer and independent contractor, but it applies to the uh, two drivers that were uh, objecting to uh, some of Uber's background check pra practices uh, in a separate uh, proposed class action. Uh, but it could have an impact on dozens of lawsuits across the nation because this is a federal court that's supporting that arbitration clause. Uh, so let's go to the next next slide. In earlier seminars or webinars that we've had, we talked about the contentious relationship between the insurance industry and, and ride-sharing firms. This has actually settled down to a large degree. Um, while regulatory-driven, the movement towards ride-sharing companies providing a substantial level of primary insurance during the period that a, that a driver has their app turned off, where they're searching for drivers, or when they're connected to the, the driver, has eased the process. Um, and there's been much more cooperation within the insurance industry. And so we uh, see at this time that there are currently uh, 15 insurance companies that I'm aware of that offer insurance across the nation, uh, at least in specified states. Uh, GEICO is offering in 20 states, Farmers in 18, 
Erie is offering it in 10 states, USAA in nine states, Liberty Mutual in, in seven states, uh, Mercury in five, and all state in seven. And are among the most active, there are several states where there is just uh, a single uh, insurer that is providing uh, uh, a single or, or two companies that are providing the insurance. However, there's still um, 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 uh, there are still 17 states where ride-sharing activity is, is active, um, but there there is no insurance coverage available through private companies. So, if I can go to the next slide. As I mentioned, uh, for the passengers, uh, there's not much of an insurance gap. There's generally equally or better coverage than the tax than is provided uh, by the insurance for a taxi driver. Um, but for drivers, there's a real question of whether their personal automobile policy will provide coverage if they're not involved uh, in one of the states of the District of Columbia where there are insurance companies that provide insurance and getting their insurance in with those companies that specifically states that they're covered. Um, there's very low coverage during the contingent period, the time um, when they're you know, searching uh, for somebody. No workers' compensation coverage. Drivers are up for their own medical coverage. I, I mentioned that earlier. If we go to the next slide. Um, this is uh, just an uh, insurance overview for, uh, for Lyft. Ubers is very similar. There's a period when you're driving with your at, with driving around as you're driving your own automobile. The app is off. This is clearly covered by your own personal policy. When the um, app has been turned on and you're searching for somebody, then there's uh, this contingent insurance uh, uh, coverage that that's made. Again, in some states, this contingent auto insurance has become primary rather than contingent. But again, fairly low coverage levels if you're involved in a, in a large accident. Um, the main problem is in both the, uh, in this period is there's limited, there is contingent uh, comprehensive and, and collision coverage, but there's a, with Lyft, there's a $2,500 deductible. With Uber, there's a, a $1,000 deductible. During the period where you actually have somebody connected, or where you've been notified of a, of a match, you're not trolling for rides, but you actually have connected to somebody to the time that you pick them up and drop them off. Uh, you have, um, you know, you have complete automotive liability to um, uh, to about um, a one million dollar uh, to a one million dollar level in in most states. Um, California is a, a little bit special that they have an additional uh, amount of insurance during that period one contingent period for uh, <clears throat> egregious uh, activities. Let's go back to Sean. Thanks, Dr. Staking, and uh, just a quick reminder that if you have a, a question for, for Dr. Staking, you may type it into the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Uh, we are collecting those here in Lexington, and we'll ask as many as time allows uh, during the course of or at the end of the program. And uh, Dr. Staking, I know next you have several slides about the profitability and competitive structure of the rideshare industry. Before, we, before you get into that part of the program, I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, there were rumors earlier this year that were eventually denied that Lyft was for sale, and there have been a number of articles uh, in the past year about how Uber is sort of the more dominant of the two companies. Uh, on sort of the other end of the the, the, the spectrum, we've got uh, we've seen a number of rideshare startups pop up pop up in places like Austin, where Uber and Lyft have had to vacate 
Um, do you think we're going to see consolidation or uh, proliferation of these companies in the years ahead? And, and what are the implications of either of those scenarios from a policy and, it, and an insurance perspective? Yeah, um, I think we will have proliferation of companies. Uber certainly has the dominant position. They are the largest company. They have the largest cap, uh, market capitalization. Um, uh, Lyft is competing heavily against them, but I believe that there is room for uh, other firms. They, they're in, in Asia and Europe, there are other firms that are operating, competing directly with, um, with Uber. Lyft has a limited presence overseas, um, but, but a growing one. Um, and some of these homegrown companies, um, you know, are, are working at, uh, at an advantage because they provide a different kind of service. Uh, you know, some of them are services where you can revert, reserve them in advance. Uh, New York City also has a, a new um, insurer called uh, uh, Juno, uh, which is one which is much more rider friendly. You know, they treat their uh, she's much more driver friendly. They treat their drivers as employees. They provide the workers compensation, other benefits. They take a lower amount. From their fare, they're taking 10% rather than the uh, 10 to 15% rather than the 25 20 per, to 25%. That's more common with Uber and Lyft, and so you're finding niche places. You know, uh, and so that once this model has been set up, it's been fairly easy for other companies to provide that. One of the companies that moved into Arizona had been. Um, into Texas had been operating in Arizona as a small company in, in uh, specific municipal areas and they were very, it was very easy for them to move into Lyft. And as, as these become more, people become more aware of them and, and, and see the choice, I think we will see a pro proliferation. But let me Great. go so, uh, the, the next slide. Uh, okay, let's, let's go and talk about that profitability and the competitive structure. And if I can ask you to move one slide up. And I'd just like to note that the financial statements in Uber and Lyft are not public. Um, these are uh, companies that were set up by venture capitalists. Uh, there have been additional investments into them. So the information that is, uh, that is available is fairly limited. Um, and what one gets in the financial press is information that's released by some of the investors or, or venture capitalists that, that are in it. We don't have complete financial statements. Um, and um, one of the things that we have found of one of the loan notes for Uber is their investment in China. Um, um, they've reportedly invested several, uh, two to three billion dollars in setting up a market in China setting up the technology, getting the drivers available, advertising it heavily. Um, and we're reported to have lost about a billion dollars and many of the partners were urging Uber to, uh, uh, to, leave, uh, uh, to leave China. If you can go to the uh, next slide. Uh, there was just intense competition um, and both Uber and um, uh, the Didi um, um, uh, Chung technology, which which was actually a, a merger between two other uh, ride-sharing companies, um, um, were just all hemorrhaging money. Uh, um, the the subsidies that were provided were apparently so 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 high um, compared to uh, what the cost of providing the services were that uh, it's reported that some of the drivers were setting up, um, um, you know, buying additional cell phone accounts and setting up uh, fake riders uh, that they would uh, connect to and then drive them a, a long distance and receive the subsidy. Um, eventually came to the point where for Uber, it was no longer viable. Uh, in China, there's always uh, 
um, uh, political and, uh, uh, um, uh, element, and I think Uber learned late in the game that um, that you can't just provide any kind of service that you wanted. So they ended up, um, you know, sort of selling out, merging their investment in China with Didi Chiang uh, technology. And they received, it's been reported, between 17 and a half and 20 percent of the merge uh, of the merged company and, and 10 million dollars in cash. Um, however, it's it's uh, when they will get that cash because uh, after they had left the market. Let's go to the next slide, please. Um, 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 you know, one, one more, please. Um, that um, that the, um, uh, that after having set up that that the, that the government is questioning um, whether the uh, whether the merger was legal under, under Chinese government standards that they did not, not they didn't apply for an antitrust review and um, Seem that they were using different numbers for their turnover. Um, they're looking at a sixty million dollar turnover when they were both uh, running through business billions of dollars of, of income. So we'll need to look at that uh, a little bit later. When we report, look at the um, uh, at the profitability within the United States, uh, you know they continue. Uh, to compete, uh, compete fiercely with each other. Uh, Uber was reported to have lost uh, 250 million dollars in 2016. Uh, in the first quarter, two, uh, 750 million dollars in the uh, in the second quarter of 2016. Um, they had a total loss uh, in the. Um, uh, uh, you know, of, of 1.25 million, 1.27 million dollars in the first half of the year, and there is no indication that the losses were going to be any, any greater than that in in future years. Um, if we compare that to 2015, we only have re I was only able to find information for the first three quarters, but for the first three quarters, they lost 1.7 billion dollars. So um, they're well in the you know their their losses seem to be increasing as their ridership increases. Uh, for Lyft, it was similar. They reported losses at about three hundred and sixty million dollars in two thousand five, and their reported loss uh, for two thousand sixteen. Uh, so far, I could just find information for the first quarter was they're losing six hundred million dollars, two times as much as they. Uh, Lost in the in the prior quarter, and much of this has to do with when when they're increasing earnings and increasing revenues and increasing losses. It's uh, there's creating uncertainty. You know, how much can they sustain this growth and increased losses and continue subsidizing uh, their drivers? If we go to the next slide. Um, and again, just noting that they're receiving, uh, obtaining, you know, more competitions from from new TNCs that are that are that are showing up. With this increase, their losses. One of the one of the big problems that they um, you know, continue to subsidize their employees at specific times, trying to make you know trying to get more drivers on the road. Uh, so far, it hasn't been successful in terms of profitability. Uh, back to you, Frank. Thanks, Dr. Stake. Hello. Uh, before we move on, uh, uh, I'd like to ask, uh, earlier you talked about uh, the legislation in Massachusetts that tax on a subsidy for the taxi industry onto every rideshare fare. But one could also make the case that Uber is the one that could use a subsidy. 
there were a, a number of articles earlier this year that they're hemorrhaging money as they try to gain market share and as they try to retain both customers and drivers. And in fact, you spoke to that uh, just a moment or two ago as well. Um, but will these companies still be able to compete and to continue innovation and expansion as they face new competition in their own sphere and perhaps with a, a government subsidized taxi industry? Well, the, the sub, let, let me address this subsidy issue. Of, you know, the, 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 does Uber or Lyft need a subsidy? Uh, the subsidy that's being provided to the taxi system is, is fairly small. Um, it's a very small amount of the, uh, of the charge that uh, Uber and Lyft are making, um, at least in, in Massachusetts. You know, I teach finance as well as risk management and insurance, and one of the key lessons that we learn is it's not just what, uh, what are the free cash flows that are being able to being paid pay back to the shareholders at the early end of the startup. But more important is the cash flow that will be generated in the future. Um, and the uh, investors that are coming in and are paying very high prices that are that are creating these very high valuations for for Uber in particular uh, believe that, that that believe in those growth opportunities that they will be able to grow and take advantage of new uses of their technology. So they're really about future growth more than, uh, more than, uh, more than present, uh, present profitability. Uber still remains very liquid. They have a large, uh, a large amount of cash that they're, you know, uh, you know uh, tens of billions of dollars in cash that they're able to continue subsidize, uh, continue paying some, some of these subsidies that they um, go through. They claim that they're profitable in most of their international operations. The U.S. is, is still less profitable. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I think that one has to look at those individuals that have better knowledge, that have uh, access to the financial statements and what they're doing. Lyft may be in a more difficult situation. They haven't been able to grow as rapidly. They uh, reportedly have less liquidity. As you mentioned, it was reported that they were on sale. Uh, Lyft denied that. Uh, later they said, it, uh, the president said they thought that this was a rumor that was spread by the founder of, of Uber as a way of, uh, of putting pressure on, on, on Lyft. Um, it's it's completely confused. You know, it's not clear what what is uh, is happening with Lyft. Um, let, let's go to the next slide, please. Oh wait, let's. Uh, Dr. Staking, thank you, uh, thank you so much for that uh, that information and that response. Um, let me take a moment. It's Frank Tomasello at Griffith to uh, to remind uh, uh, our attendees that if you have a question for today's speaker, uh, we encourage you to enter it into the GoToWebinar taskbar at any time. Uh, we will ask as many of our questions as time allows. Um, Dr. Staking, next I believe you're going to talk a bit about the intersection of ride sharing and autonomous vehicles. And I know that uh, this is something that both CSG and Griffith have a great interest in. Uh, as a native of the Pittsburgh area, uh, I've been watching closely what's gone on there this summer with the uh, introduction of Uber's fleet of autonomous vehicles. Um, as we watch these technologies converge, uh, I wonder if you might speak a bit about the insurance implications that you see ahead. Um, I would certainly be happy to do that. Let's go to the next slide. Um, driverless cars and ride sharing. Uh, there are estimates uh, that, right, that driverless cars with full functionality will be on the on the streets and actually begin to take a majority of the uh, the ride starting uh, between 10 and 30 years from now, um, and uh, if you'd asked me that question two years ago, I would have said, you know, we are decades away before people can even begin to think of doing something. So we have Google that's providing ride sharing. Uh, that's 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 done a lot of work on on riderless cars. Um, um, Volvo and and others have been looking at riderless trucks. Um, uh, Uber purchased a, 
uh, a company in, that's auto that's working with uh, OTTO that's working with riderless riderless trucks. Um, and there, I'm not going to go over, over everything that's in this slide. There's a lot of information there that I'll let you uh, look at that. But you know, they're looking at um, as consumers begin to adopt vehicles. Um, that there is a time when the when the ride sharing will become very important when people no longer have the fear of getting into a car that doesn't have a rider in it, and at one point they will become the primary means of transport. Let's let's go to the next slide um, quickly. Um, President of the Institute of Insurance Institute for Highway Safety is reporting that those cars. Uh, that have some kind of collision avoidance system. These are not riderless cars, um, but they're ones that you know send out a little bit of radar to help you parallel park, and they will show you if somebody is moving into your lane or if somebody is barking, driving, um, braking right in front of you. They will you know send you a warning, and they will start uh, slowing down the car automatically. Has already decreased their accident rate by 17 to 15 percent from other vehicles. Um, let's go to the next slide. And the proposal going out again to this 2040 period when uh, ride sharing, or excuse me, when driverless cars are, are common, is that accident frequency will reduce significantly. Uh, they're looking at a 77 percent reduction um, in accident frequency. and well, they don't discuss uh, the severity of the losses. My guess is that the severity of the losses will be falling even more rapidly um, because that you will have, even when you have an accident, you'll have vehicles that are driving slower when in trying to avoid that. Um, Uber's uh, investment in Philadelphia, uh, done together with Carnegie Mellon, uh, Mellon uh, Car Carnegie Mellon University Center has been extremely important. Um, you know, you bring some of the some of the greatest minds that are involved in um, in engineering, in um, in automotive technologies, uh, in computer technologies, together with that. Um, and the chief executive of, of Uber, Travis Kalanick, has noted that they're planning to reduce their million human drivers with robots as quickly as possible, noting that that is, is, is many ways, many years away, but uh, the riderless technology is, could be extremely appropriate for, um, for ride-sharing opportunities. You know, this eliminates a lot of the, the issues of whether you're an independent driver or not, who is responsible for the insurance, since the Uber would own the cars as well as being providing, uh, providing the, the services. It undoes one of the claims that Uber and Lyft are making that they're creating an, creating employment. So, you know, this is uh, something that we will see, but I imagine it will be 10 to 20 years before we have rider, more than a few riderless cars um, in Philadelphia, San Francisco, and a couple of other places where, where Google is operating. Great. Thank you, Dr. Staking. Uh, and ladies and gentlemen, we're nearly at that point in the program when Dr. Staking is going to be uh, responding to your questions. So if there's something you'd like to ask, please enter it in the GoToWebinar taskbar on your screen. Uh, before we get to questions, Dr. Staking, we talk a lot about uh, rideshare companies being a key part of this thing called the sharing economy. And I know you wanted to talk about an insurance provider that is playing in that space and sort of the implications of that. Yes, this is a this is a new development. There's a um, um, uh, let's go one one more one more slide, please. Um, there is a company that was formed in 2014. It just started offering policies in October of this year, called Lemonade. Uh, they're a sharing economy insurance. So at this point, they're just providing homeowner and rate, renter insurance. But they have a very unique approach. They're trying to um, work on the kind of trust uh, between the insurer and uh, and their customers that 
Uber and Lyft and other uh, sharing economy firms are trying to develop. Uh, they're only uh, authorized to operate in New York at this time. They've been authorized by the New York regulators. Um, but they're working under this concept that they want to partner with the uh, insurers. So rather than um, this this conflict where the the rent where the ins the insurer is always trying to maximize how much they can charge, and the insured is uh, worried about you know the the company gouging. They're setting a a, a set standard that we will uh, only charge twenty percent of the payment that will go to to Lemonade, and they have approximately another twenty percent that's going to purchase re reinsurance that will. Um, um, that will make sure that uh, all uh, all accidents will be paid, even if Lemonade doesn't have enough um, company it's in its surplus to do so. Um, they're also looking at creating social media uh, groupings. They're finding people that have um, uh, a specific interest, a specific charity that they want to support, a specific university that they, they would like to support, and any excess funds that are not used by the end of the year are paid to that charity. Um, and uh, and with the idea that the that the insurer that the insurer is not going to charge a higher claim because they want their money to go to the insurer, they're going to charge and make a fair claim. The insurance company will not be gouging them. Uh, it may be a, a model for other insurers because they, if they're able to develop these cohorts, generally low risk, generally young professionals uh, that will be joining this, they may have a, be able to attract a, uh, a lower risk risk group. Do I have one slide remaining on lemonade? Uh, no, that's 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 the only okay. one. Uh, and so it's this idea that you know. Insurance in the sharing economy is not limited to ride sharing. We have now renters insurance and homeowners insurance. Um, it won't be long before uh, you see sharing economy insurers that are focusing um, on other elements of, uh, of insurance that are critical in our lives, life insurance programs, etc. So let me stop there and go back. Go to your question. Great. Thanks again, Dr. Staking. We're going to move now to questions. Uh, and uh, again, uh, if you have one, you can enter your question in the GoToWebinar taskbar on your screen. We'll see it here in Lexington and be able to have Dr. Staking respond. We just have a few minutes left. Uh, but Dr. Staking, I wanted to ask you, there are a number of cities uh, where transit agencies have either contracted with rideshare companies or they've been talking about how they can be used to fill gaps in public transit. Um, and they're places as diverse as Nashville and Summit, New Jersey and Centennial, Colorado and Detroit and Washington, D.C. and San Francisco and Atlanta, uh, Philadelphia, Dallas, Cincinnati and Pittsburgh, uh, even places like rural Nebraska. Uh, if we're no longer talking about rideshare as simply a uh, first mile, last mile option, or a taxi substitute, but as an essential part of a public transit system, does that present additional challenges from a public policy perspective and an insurance perspective? You know, I don't think it provides uh, additional challenges from an insurance perspective. From a po pu public policy perspective, I think it's actually very positive. And it actually reflects what is happening in ride sharing. Uh, not everyone takes uh, a ride share from San Francisco to the airport, uh, you know, a large 40 mile, 40 mile drive, but a number of people will take public transit that will get to downtown San Francisco and then they will use um, Uber to uh, uh, go to their destination if it's, uh, if it's limited. Outside of the downtown area in San Francisco, there are uh, some bus lines, uh, some municipal uh, metro uh, uh, type of, uh, of systems, but they don't go very close to where somebody has to go. I, I know 
recently I took a, uh, uh, I needed to go in San Francisco something, so I drove to the BART station, I took the metro to San Francisco uh, to one of the stations, and I, the last um, five minutes of my ride, which would have been a 25 million, 25 minute walk to a, uh, an area which was not, which I, I did not know well, um, um, you know, made it made it much much easier for me. Um, and so you're having people take Uber to the BART station or to other public transportation centers. And I I think the fact that the um, the regional transport transport uh, organizations are recognizing this and finding ways that they can. Uh, contract with or join with rideshare driving um, to make public transport more feasible, more popular, and uh, you know get more cars off the road. Great. Well, we are just uh, about out of time for today's webinar. We've come to the end of our hour here. Uh, Dr. Staking, thank you so much again for joining us this afternoon. Thanks also to Frank Tomasello from the Griffith Foundation. Uh, as always, this webinar will be archived and available on the CSG Knowledge Center and on the Griffith Foundation website. Uh, so if you missed any part of the program or would like to recommend it to a friend, it will be available soon. Be sure to check the CSG website for information about future eCademy webinars and to check the Griffith Foundation website for information on risk management and insurance resources and programs. Uh, I'm Sean Sloan at CSG headquarters in Lexington. Thank you so much for joining us and have a good afternoon.